Hello, today's topic is on electron diffraction. Um, this, these uh, experiments, a set of experiments, they provided the experimental proof for de Broglie's idea. Uh, remember that uh, de Broglie proposed his idea in 1923. Now, within four years uh, after, um, in 1927, two groups of experimentalists, one in USA and the other in England, they were able to produce a diffraction of electron beam. So first let us look at the US team. Uh, they were uh, Clinton J. Davison and Lester Germer. Davison sitting on the left side, the senior person. They were both scientists at the um, Bell Telephone Laboratories in New Jersey. From 1925 onwards, they were studying the scattering of electrons from different metal surfaces. On the, on the left side, we can see the experimental arrangement of Davison and Germer. This is an evacuated chamber. And uh, on one end, we have an electron gun. There is a low voltage battery here. So when current is passed through this filament, electron beam will be emitted. Then uh, this is then a, a high voltage, high positive voltage is applied here, negative voltage here. So this filament acts as the cathode. This is the usual arrangement discharge tube apparatus. Uh, this filament acts as the cathode and this um, slit acts as the anode. So electron beam will be uh, accelerated uh, towards the anode and anode also acts as the collimator. So we get a narrow electron beam. Okay. This electron beam is allowed to incident on a nickel uh, crystal and it is scattered in various directions. And here we have a movable electron detector. It can be uh, rotated along this axis. Okay. So when you move the detector, uh, we can calculate uh, phi is the angle between the incident electron beam and the scattered electron beam. Okay, so when the electron detector is moved along this uh, axis, we can calculate the number of electrons scattered in different angles. Okay, maybe when detector is here, number of electrons scattered through 10 degree, 20 degree, 30 degree, etc. We can calculate. Okay, then uh, they plotted a polar graph. Um, Showing the showing how the intensity of the scattered electrons uh, varies with um, scattering angle. Okay, so in this polar graph, there is no x and y axis. Uh, this incident beam is uh, this beam electron incident beam. This acts as a reference axis to measure the polar angle. Maybe we can take this as the z axis. Okay, so this polar angle is measured with respect to this reference axis. So this is simply z axis which coincides with the incident beam and uh, so in, we know that in polar graph there are only two variables some angle theta and a radial distance so the this is the origin that is origin is the point of incidence of the incident beam on the nickel crystal okay so the the radial distance from the origin to some point gives it's a measure of the intensity of the scattered electron so if the radial distance is large it means the intensity is large if radial distance is small, it means intensity is small. Okay, so this is the two ideas. Um, so this uh, polar angle gives the angle from the incident beam. So if you look at this figure, the angle phi from the incident beam, uh, we can call it scattering angle. And this angle is the same as the polar angle. Okay, because uh, here also the scattering angle is measured with respect to the incident beam. Uh, this polar angle is also measured with respect to the z, z axis which coincides with the incident beam. So polar angle is the same as the scattering angle phi we can say. And uh, so one angle is phi and the radial distance gives you the intensity of the, uh, the scattered electron. So intensity means uh, in the case of a beam of particles, intensity is uh, number of particles per unit area per unit time. So intensity large means more particles, more electrons are scattered in that direction. So uh, typically they got a, a graph like this. Okay. So the meaning of this graph is, um, see, uh, consider Okay. Uh, let us consider um, electron beam scattered through uh, so through uh, an angle, let us say uh, 10 degree or 20 degree. Then um, okay, so what we have to do is uh, draw.
this radial distance okay gives then uh, the, the intensity of uh, electron scattered through this much angle let us say this angle is some 10 degree okay maybe intensity is somewhere here okay so when um, when you go to the next angle let us say intensity corresponds to this maybe i will take another intensity corresponds to this point so which is at a radial distance this much from the origin so that means uh, compared to this radial distance at 10 degree uh, this is the radial distance at let us say this is 20 degree okay so we can see that the radial distance decreases again what you see is that the radial distance decreases with the angle okay this angle is this is a large angle okay this angle a large angle um, let us say 40 degree or 45 degree so what you see is that as uh, the scattering angle or polar angle increases the this uh, radial distance from the origin decreases so if you join all these curve we get a uh, curve like this okay so this is the idea um, so the point is that um, they got the result that uh, they got the result that uh, the intensity of the scattered electrons decreases monotonously or continuously with the scattering angle this is the typical graph that they obtained uh, then what they did was uh, they changed the accelerating voltage between the cathode and the anode see uh, then they got different polar graphs for different uh, accelerating voltages at 40 volt uh, the graph is as we have seen earlier uh, a, a monotonous decrease in intensity then as accelerating voltage of the electron beam increases what we see is that there is a slight variation in intensity okay uh, up to here intensity gradually decreases but, but then there is an increase and then a decrease okay so this variation in intensity sudden variation in intensity an increase and a decrease okay that uh, uh, that variation or that bump Mm -hmm. that uh, increases with accelerating voltage and they get maximum variation at 54 volt accelerating voltage and 50 degree scattering angle again when they increase to the accelerating voltage uh, this uh, variation decreases and uh, at some higher uh, let us say some 65 or 70 volt uh, they get a graph similar to the one at 40 volt okay there is only gradual decrease in uh, monotonous decrease in intensity so this tip, this type of a variation in intensity there is a decrease and an increase and there is a decrease this type of a variation uh, incre decrease increase and then decrease that type of a variation is typical of diffraction patterns okay intensity varies with the uh, angle hmm? so this is an indication that uh, electron beam is undergoing some diffraction in the in the crystal in the nickel crystal okay um, but we cannot uh, qualitatively, qualitatively make a conclusion like that. We have to do some calculations. Let us see. Now let us calculate um, the condition for diffraction. Um, at uh, 54 volt, the kinetic energy of the electron beam is 54 electron volt. Now this 54 electron volt, volt beam is actually a low energy beam. The kinetic energy is low. When the kinetic energy is low, uh, here we are discussing one way of looking at this uh, diffraction condition when the kinetic energy is low typically the electron beam will be scattered from the atoms on the surface layer okay the, the electron beam will not have uh, enough kinetic energy to penetrate uh, beyond the surface level you know, into the depth of the crystal okay so the dif the scattering will happen only from the surface layer so let us consider two uh, electron uh, rays scattered from atoms uh, neighboring atoms on the surface layer so this is one ray it is scattered like this this is uh, another ray uh, they are they both are scattered along the same angle right this angle uh, is scattering angle phi so the the another ray is scattered from the neighboring atom along the same angle phi this angle is same as this angle so we have got two parallel beams two scattered beams 
what is the path difference between these two beams if you drop a perpendicular here suppose the interatomic space interatomic distance for the atoms on a plane is d then if you look at this if you drop a perpendicular here then from this small right angle triangle the path difference between these two beams is only this small distance okay from here onwards the two uh, rays are identical uh, they are having they are covering identical distance so the path difference is this much if this distance is d as we have shown here then um, okay uh, this angle is phi then uh, this angle must be 90 minus phi okay if the hypotenuse is d the this line should be d uh, hypotenuse times cos 90 minus phi okay this angle small angle here this angle here is phi so the small angle here must be 90 minus phi so what you get here is d cos 90 minus phi and uh, cos 90 minus phi is sin phi so the path difference between the two beams will be d sin phi scattered from the surface of surface layer only now this d sin phi path difference must be an integral multiple of lambda for constructive interference between these two beams if the path difference is an integral multiple of lambda there will be constructive interference between the two beams and we get a maximum intensity so the condition for getting maximum intensity uh, of the diffracted uh, or, or, or the scattered electron beam uh, electron beam scattered from the surface layer only is that d sin phi equal to n lambda okay now let us uh, do this calculation Um, so what are the different values here uh, in the case of the nickel crystal the value of d is 0.215 nanometer okay and uh, what is the angle phi from the previous figure remember that uh, they get maximum variation intensity at the scattering angle 50 degree okay for in this figure also see here as uh, i have discussed earlier this angle this angle is phi okay so this angle must be 90 minus 5 so therefore this distance is uh, d cos sorry uh, d d yeah d cos 90 minus 5 which means d sin phi okay uh, so this angle is uh, 50 degree and uh, for first order because we have got only one uh, bump one uh, small bump in the in, in the intensity curve so let us say this is first order diffraction so n is equal to 1 so in this uh, equation d sin phi equal to n lambda if you substitute d phi and n we get uh, lambda as uh, if you do this calculation you get 0.165 nanometer okay so this, this means that if the electron beam is uh, electron beam scattered from the surface layer of the nickel crystal is behaving like a wave okay if the, the the bump in the intensity curve is due to the diffraction of this electron beam then uh, according to the, the the diffraction formula okay according to the diffraction formula d sin phi equal to n lambda the wavelength of this electron beam must be 0.165 nanometer okay this is one calculation there can be an alternative way of looking at uh, the same phenomenon um, suppose uh, the electron beam uh, let us say at uh, even at 54 electron volt the, ele the electron beam has uh, enough uh, kinetic energy to go to other uh, crystal planes okay not only on the surface but uh, beneath the surface if uh, such a uh, scattering electron beam is scattered from different consecutive planes below the surface uh, let us look at uh, that uh, figure uh, electron beam is scattered from one plane another plane etc some some inclined plane okay and this angle is our angle phi from the previous figures angle between the incident beam and the scattered beam okay now the angle theta shown here is the angle between the electron beam and the uh, crystal plane some inclined crystal plane okay the, this angle is theta and also this angle is also theta angle between the incident beam and the crystal plane also angle between the scattered beam and the crystal plane if you have uh, this type of a, a, a glancing scattering hmm, then uh, from from consecutive layers then we can use uh, Bragg's law 
this equation 2d sin theta equal to n lambda we have derived this uh, in in first unit in particle properties of waves when we discussed x rays um, uh, see uh, bragg's law is the condition for maximum intensity in x ray diffraction consider this these are two x rays they are scattered from consecutive adjacent planes of a crystal then uh, it is easy to show that uh, the path difference between the incident ray and scattered rays there is a value d sin theta here and d sin theta but d is the interplanar distance or, or the interatomic distance between atoms in adjacent planes so this is d sin theta plus d sin theta or 2d sin theta that 2d sin theta should be equal to m lambda the same formula we can apply here also uh, the only thing is that this is uh, you have to tilt this figure that's all okay uh, so instead of phi we can write the diffraction condition in terms of theta so what is the value of theta let us first uh, find out what is the value of theta okay uh, this is uh, let us uh, have let us say this angle is also theta so you can see that theta here and uh, theta and this phi together we can write as uh, 2 theta plus phi should be 180 degree okay what is phi from the previous figures phi is 50 degree so this means that theta is 65 degree okay so in this formula uh, we have got theta as 65 degree and n is again one first order diffraction what is d d is the the interplanar distance see in the, the figure d is the interplanar distance okay uh, between uh, two adjacent planes in nickel and that value is 0 0.091 nanometer okay again if you substitute the value of d this d is different from the d we have used in the previous slide okay that is the interatomic distance uh, between atoms on a plane here the d is the interatomic distance between atoms on two adjacent planes okay see uh, then if you substitute these values here again lambda is 0.165 nanometer okay so whether the the scan diffraction is taking place between electrons scattered from the surface layer only or between uh, electrons scattered from adjacent uh, layers uh, we can use the, the formula for the the maximum intensity of the diffracted beam will be slightly different uh, and, and the value of the interatomic separation will also be slightly different but the, I, when you use either formula the value of the wavelength of the electron beam uh, producing this type of a diffraction uh, intensity diffraction maxima at a 50 degree scattering angle must be 0.165 nanometer so we have calculated the uh, wavelength of the electron beam from the point of view of uh, diffraction of a wave from the point of view of diffraction formula now the question is um, are these de Broglie waves are these uh, electron waves undergoing diffraction in the nickel crystal de Broglie waves in other words we can ask this what is the de Broglie wavelength of an electron accelerated through 54 volt okay this we can calculate by this formula this formula already we have obtained in the previous classes um, this is actually de Broglie formula if you remember lambda is uh, uh, Planck's constant by momentum so momentum you can write uh, in terms of kinetic energy square root of uh, uh, 2m kinetic energy so Planck's lambda is h by square root of 2m kinetic energy when electron is accelerated through some voltage v potential difference v then kinetic energy is q times v so if you substitute h mass of the electron charge of the electron etc uh, the finally you can obtain a simple formula square root of 150.45 divided by v angstrom where v is in volts v is the accelerating voltage here what is the accelerating voltage 54 volt if you substitute what you get is 1.67 angstrom or 0.167 nanometer uh, look at the previous uh, slides uh, you used the diffraction formula either uh, for diffraction for electron beam from the uh, scattering of electron beam from the surface layer only uh, or scattering of electron beam from the neighboring layers in either case you, you have obtained from the diffraction formula that um, 
the wavelength of the electron beam must be 0.165 nanometer. Now here we did not worry about diffraction. We simply looked at uh, de Broglie's concept that any moving particle should have a wave nature. So electron beam accelerated through this much 54 volt must have a wave nature and that de Broglie's calculation is, uh, is 0.167 nanometer and the two values 0.165 nanometer from the diffraction formula 0.167 nanometer from the de Broglie formula the two values are very close this clearly indicates that uh, electron beam is undergoing diffraction and the, the wavelength of the electron beam is exactly as predicted by de Broglie so this is a clear experimental proof of de Broglie's idea I am just showing here um, the graphs from the original paper of Davison and Germer in 1927. Okay, these are their original graphs. We have used more or less the same graphs. See here, um, at this 54 volt, the lambda shown here is 1.67 angstrom. Exactly that uh, we have obtained here. In fact, this formula, square root of 150.45 uh, divided by uh, V. Uh, that uh, formula is there in their original paper and uh, they have used the diffraction formula for diffraction scattering of electron beam from the surface layer that is d sin phi equal to n lambda okay so this is uh, just to show their actual uh, graphs let us uh, now look at the other um, group uh, this is mainly by the person gp thompson uh, he did the experiment in the same year 1927 he was uh, working in Aberdeen University in Scotland um, so in his case remember that in Davison Germer case they were uh, doing uh, the diffraction of electron beam uh, scattered from a crystal okay so diffraction by scattering that type of uh, apparatus that type of experimental arrangement now what uh, Thompson uh, GP Thompson did was uh, slightly different uh, an electron beam is coming and it is allowed to pass through a thin layer of uh, a, maybe a metal a thin layer like a gold foil okay so um, the electron beam passes through this gold foil okay thin layer and uh, the transmitted beam is allowed to incident on a screen okay then he photographed the screen he took the photograph of the screen so how the electron beam uh, is uh, incident uh, this beam of particles are incident at different points on the screen that pattern he took the photograph so what he found is that uh, you, if you remember uh, x-ray diffraction this is a typical uh, structure of x-ray diffraction also an x-ray beam is coming allowed it to pass through a crystal and uh, we get uh, diffraction by transmission okay diffraction by transmission so in the same way he could obtain uh, when he photographed the the screen hmm, uh, then uh, he used a photographic plate uh, at the screen so what you what he obtained was the diffraction pattern of not x-rays but electron beam okay and uh, on the left hand side you can see the electron diffraction pattern of a thin layer of gold obtained by gp thompson Okay, electron beam is scat uh, transmitted through a thin layer of gold and uh, the pattern on the screen is like this okay if you remember uh, x-ray diffraction pattern this is exactly like the debye Scherer pattern in x-ray diffraction uh, on the right hand side for comparison i have shown the x-ray diffraction pattern of a powdered rock sample from mars okay this uh, i have used it earlier in in the class on x-rays so you can see the same debye Scherer pattern here here also you get the debye Scherer pattern. So this is typical of uh, um, um, the diffraction pattern obtained in polycrystalline samples. Okay, if the sample contains a lot of crystals arranged in random directions, uh, single crystals arranged randomly, then uh, it's, uh, such a powdered sample, this is a powdered sample. Uh, in the same way, uh, this is analogous to the X-ray diffraction in powder crystals okay, or polycrystalline samples. So what G.P. Thompson photographed was, uh, this is actually from the, the paper on original paper on G.P. Thompson. So he got a, uh, the, one of the first uh, photograph or direct photograph of uh, electron diffraction pattern. So remember the difference between the experimental setup of uh, Davison and Germer and uh, G.P. Thompson. Davison and Germer were studying diffraction by scattering of electron beams. Uh, Thompson was studying diffraction by transmission on of electron beams 
Uh, again, uh, look at uh, this is not uh, Thomson's results, but uh, just uh, have a look at uh, the electron diffraction pattern of an icosahedride single crystal. So, if it is a single crystal, we get Lave spots, just like in X-ray diffraction. Uh, look at the X-ray diffraction pattern on a single uh, single crystal. This is a scandium zinc quasi crystal. Okay, uh, this is a beautiful pattern. You get uh, Lave spots here. In the same way electron diffraction pattern of a, a single crystal here we, we get lave spots so if it's a single crystal we get lave spots if it's a polycrystalline sample or a powdered sample we get a debye sugar pattern okay so we cannot distinguish by looking at the photograph we cannot say which is x-ray pattern x-ray diffraction pattern and which is electron diffraction pattern so these uh, photographs clearly show that uh, electron beams are undergoing uh, diffraction just like x-rays so with this experimental evidence in 1927, within four years after de Broglie's idea, uh, experimental evidence was there and uh, the idea of matter waves are, were widely accepted. And uh, after two years, de Broglie was awarded Nobel Prize in Physics in 1929. Again, eight years after, Davison from the American team and uh, G.P. Thompson were awarded Nobel Prize in Physics in 1937 for electron diffraction experiments. Now regarding... Um, G.P. Thomson, there is a, another uh, one more side story. G.P. Thomson is actually the son of J.J. Thomson. Now, if you if you remember about uh, J.J. Thomson, in 1897, J.J. Thomson discovered the particle nature of electron. Okay, exactly 30 years later, in 1927, his son G.P. Thomson discovered the wave nature of electron. Actually, both uh, uh, obtain their Nobel prizes in physics for their these ex, these exact discoveries. J.J. Um, Thomson got um, a Nobel prize in physics in 1906, and almost 30 years later, in 1937, his son G.P. Thomson got Nobel prize in physics um, for the wave nature of electrons. So it is usually jokingly said that father um, got Nobel prize for discovering the particle nature of electron, and the son got Nobel prize in physics. Um, for discovering the wave nature of electrons. So there is an apparent uh, disagreement between them. Uh, one says that uh, electron is a particle and the other says that electron is a wave. And there is an interesting comment uh, about this by the science historio historian uh, Graham Farmelo. This is, these are his words. And as in so many father-son disagreements, they were both right. Now, after electron diffraction, uh, diffraction people were uh, started doing diffraction by other particles also. For example, here we have diffraction of neutrons by sodium chloride crystal. Okay, thermal neutrons, uh, neutrons which are in thermal equilibrium at room temperature, 300 Kelvin. Uh, thermal neutrons have a de Broglie wavelength of 0 0.181 nanometer. We have actually done a problem about uh, thermal neutrons and the neutron diffraction in sodium chloride crystal okay so they have a wavelength of uh, thermal neutrons have a wavelength of 0 0.181 nanometer this uh, 0 0.181 nanometer means 1.81 angstrom this is typical interplanar distance in crystal so neutron diffraction is a standard technique to study crystal structure not only neutrons uh, uh, people started doing diffraction in different crystals by proton beam by helium atoms hydrogen atoms okay by molecules small molecules Okay, even larger molecules. Let us see. Uh, on the left side, what we see is electron diffraction pattern at a double slit uh, done by Klaus Johnson in 1961. The importance of this uh, experiment is that uh, this was the first time uh, diffraction was possible by uh, single electrons. Okay, um, at each uh, time uh, during the exposure uh, there is there was practically only one electron between the slit and the screen okay the, the intensity of the source was controlled to a very low value so this was done in 1961 and that was a historical experiment and uh, 40 years later when we come to 2003 uh, on the right side you can see uh, the diffraction pattern produced by carbon 60 molecules Carbon-60 molecules are called fullerenes. Uh, it's a, um, the geometrical shape is like that of a football. 
the single a single molecule contains 60 carbon atoms so it's a large bulky molecules uh, bulky molecule and uh, using such beams of full rings uh, this team uh, was able to do uh, diffraction at a grating and uh, look at this diffraction in intensity variation it is just like the usual uh, diffraction pattern produced at uh, different slits so um, these range so between 1961 and uh, 2003 in this 40 year period people were doing diffraction by different different uh, larger and larger molecules so very complex molecules so Today, um, this type of particle diffraction is possible by, by uh, large molecules, quite large molecules, even larger than fullerenes. So this clearly showed that uh, what De Broglie said was correct. Every moving particle has a wave nature. So, so long as the, the size of the particle is um, um, such that uh, we, we, we are able to devise a proper experiment, uh, so that there are these part beams of particles are able to pass through some slits we can produce diffraction pattern this is of course not possible for macroscopic particles like a cricket ball or a, a, even a dust particle in air okay because of their size is very large and uh, the, the de Broglie wavelength is uh, of the order of Planck's constant and raised to minus 34 so it is not possible we know that uh, to produce diffraction pattern the size of the slit should be comparable to the wavelength so that is not possible for macroscopic particles but for smaller particles uh, <clears throat> not only electron proton neutron like that but even for larger molecules like fullerenes we can produce diffraction pattern with uh, this let us conclude today's uh, discussion on particle diffraction or electron diffraction and, uh, and, and in general particle diffraction now let us um, come back to our matter wave let us ask this question what is waving in a matter wave what is varying in a, in a matter wave or what is the nature of this wave okay so this we will discuss in the next class the topic on next class it will be probability waves okay see you